Hello, Gary. Hi, Guy. How are you doing? Well, I'm one floor below you today, and we are in Vilnius, which is the capital of Lithuania. And it's a very, very, very beautiful city and thriving metropolis, it would appear, from what I've seen of it. Well, a lot of these Baltic countries that we've been to are just fantastic, aren't they? I mean, they're they're really on my map. I want to bring some of the family back now. I'm really excited by uh, some of these cities. Beautiful. Definitely. What, and what is fascinating is these three countries we've been to, the three Baltic states, Latvia and Estonia, Estonia and Estonia, is that they all have completely different languages. Yeah, absolutely. Completely. So it's which is brilliant. Anyway, enough of that. We're talking to Ken Scott today, which has been the most fantastic rabbit hole because it's not just there's a couple of big obvious ones, but there's so much other stuff that I can't wait to get into. Okay, so I'll talk about the obvious ones. The obvious ones is the very first album he ever produced was Hunky Dory. He then did Ziggy Stardust, The Lad Insane, Pin Ups. Before then, he was an engineer for The Beatles on a lot of their later work on the White Album. Well, all the way back to Revolver, in fact, and if, if not before. And Pink Floyd. Well, yeah, he would have been around when those early Pink Floyd albums would have been made uh, with, with Sid Barrett as well. Oh, and Elton John, Elton of course, John, he yeah. worked on Elton John. And he produced Supertramp. It's Crime of the Century and Crisis. What Crisis? Yeah. But I know you're really excited about some of the jazz funk stuff. I am. No, I am. because I've actually been on a deep dive because you forget, I started playing bass in 1975 and it was all about Stanley Clark. I remember being absolutely terrified, thinking, this is who I'm supposed to be. I mean, thank thank Christ <laughs> punk turned up when it did. <laughs> but I'd just been listening to some of that, Billy Cobham, and I'd just been listening to Stanley Clark's School Days, and I remember it so well from the 70s now. Yeah. What a track that is. It's brilliant. So, um, and then later on, he, he worked with Duran Duran, and he's worked with Level 42. I know, you know... Everyone, Devo, I mean, all points, and Harry Nilsson, I mean, it's every, all points. It's The Tubes. Fee Way The Bill. Tubes, a band who never got their due, I reckon. Anyway, let's get him on. Welcome to the Rock on Tours. Okay, guys, I'm ready. Well, it's a big tune for sure. I actually wrote that originally for Tina Turner. Of course, I had gone and found Joni Mitchell down in Florida and brought her back. I've listened to a few of them and they've been really good, man. I'm sitting in the back of the car coming into London. They're brilliant. Thank you guys for still being around, still making music, still being into it and doing this podcast. It, it's uh, it's fabulous. So great to talk to two guys that have done this. Remember me? I'm in a band now. <laughs> it's called Roxy Music. You know this thing about the 10,000 hours of experience? Oh, yeah. To, to get good at something. When we recorded Arnold Lane, we'd done about 50 hours. The Rock Hunters podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt. Yay! Ken. Hi. Hello, Ken. Ken, I'm Gary. I think we I met know. once before. We did. You interviewed me about uh, David and uh, at the Beeb. Yeah, that's right. Hi, Ken. I'm Guy. Yep. I'm not sure that we have met. No, I don't think we have. Look, I, don't, I don't think we have. No. Other, than, know, other than through uh, Rock on Tours, which I've listened to quite a lot recently. Oh, wow. oh fantastic. Oh, it's great. It, it, wow. It's hearing from so many people that I, our paths have crossed. It's been very interesting for me. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. Y you know, oh, we can go now. That's yeah, it. Right. We're done. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, we're, we're actually on tour right now with, with Nick Mason. Yes, I know. It might be a really good place to start, actually. Because Nick actually uh, said to say hello to you. Oh, that's great. Please morning. say hi to, yeah. back to him for me. Although he can't remember what you worked on together. Okay. <laughs> so I did the, the last recording, which was a single uh, paint box and apples and oranges. With, wow. with Sid? With Sid, yes. And then started the next album with, with Gilmore. The one track I remember was Corporal Clegg. But apparently, according to the paperwork, I've done a bit more than just that. But that's the only one I can remember. Oh, that's amazing. Wow, so that was with Norman Smith? It was indeed, yeah, the great Norman Smith. And so what was assisting like back then? Because there weren't so many buttons <laughs> that there became. No, well... Uh, on oh, no, those, it wasn't assisting. It was the it was the full engineer. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I'd, Apologies. Bef, bef, no, don't worry. <laughs> uh, I'd started a bit before that with a small band that uh, I don't know if anyone's heard of called the Beatles. Uh, and uh, no, what, what, what who, who <laughs> yeah, was in yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I got that. It was a complete fluke. I was just put in there, not knowing what the hell I was doing. And yeah, there were less buttons then. It was an eight in four out board. And I still had no idea what I was doing, and it took me a while to learn. And I was learning with the 
biggest band in the world. It was absolutely ridiculous. Was it White Coats at that no, point? Th- no. Oh, no. Let's, let's and get rid of Byros. this right Byros now. Byros in the pocket. No, let's get rid of this right now. There, the way it went at Abbey Road, EMI Recording Studios as it was then, was that you had the brown coats. They wore brown lab coats. Oh. They were like the, the studio roadies. They would help the drummers in. They would set up for large orchestras and all of that kind of thing. Oh, like porters sort of. Yes, yeah. Then you had the Amproom guys. They were the technical wizards, and they were the ones that wore the white lab coats. Oh. And the reason they did it was we weren't allowed to touch mic cables or anything like that. A session had to be set up by them. The mics were put in place according to a diagram done by the engineer. Uh, and so they were wrapping up all of these dirty cables and all of that kind of thing. They would be going into the echo chambers, which were, they were damp. They were, they weren't particularly nice places to go into. And how big were they? How big were the echo chambers? A small room size. Yeah. Don't you remember them right, going? Yeah. I remember you used to go, I used to go in the plate rooms and have a look in the plate rooms in the old days. I, I don't really remember. No, no. Of course, they're all rented out as luxury flats. Now, <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, it was well, one of the great. No, not, not Abbey Road. They still have uh, okay. uh, at least one, I know, the number two echo chamber. Ken, let's but, just explain that to people yes. who don't know what a, okay. you know, a plate reverb is. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a small room which is highly reflective. Most of them have tiles all around. The ones at Abbey Road, they made a little more complex. They put these large drain pipes in them. And what it is, is you have a speaker at one end which pumps out whatever you want to put the echo on, the reverb on and a mic at the other end, and it bounces around the room and it's picked up by the mic and that gives you reverb. A plate reverb was made by a company called EMT a few years later, and it was this big box with this piece of metal in it with uh, part of a loudspeaker in the middle and two transducers like uh, pickups on an electric guitar Mm -hmm. that could be moved in and out. And you'd pump through to the speaker bit in the middle the plate would move, the metal plate would move a bit, be picked up by these transducers and give you another form of reverb. And the great thing about that, number one, it took up less space than an echo chamber. And number two, you could actually change the the timing by moving the transducers closer to the speaker part. It was shorter. The further out you put it, the longer the reverb. So you get up to about five and a half seconds, I think, of reverb on it. Then, of course, came digital and that changed everything. The Lexicon 224. Yeah. No yeah. mixing desk was without it. <laughs> right. Without that controller. But we can work our way into the Beatles in just a second, because what I really would like to, to, what I'm wondering is how you got to that point in your life and, and what it inspired you as a young man. I got into rock and roll, Bill Haley, Eddie Cochran, Elvis, of course, probably about age 10. And Oh, wow, young. Yes, it was all starting to happen at that point. And I got a tape recorder, a Grundig TK25, uh, when I was 12 and a half, got it for Christmas, mm. and I fell in love with tape. I loved the smell of tape. I loved the feel of tape. I loved being able to edit tape. Every Saturday evening, I'd be listening to and recording a lot of Pick of the Pops with uh, David Jacobs, yeah. which was the only place on the light program that you got the latest records that we wanted anyway, the latest rock and roll records. And a year and a half maybe later, there was a series on, on TV called Here Come the Girls. Whoever the producers were picked a, a different British girl singer that was fairly well known at that time. And they did one half hour episode on that singer. Well, I had the hots for a young lady called Carol Dean. Oh, and yeah, it had a yeah. couple of minor Fantastic. hits covering yeah, yeah. a couple of uh, American songs. Uh, yeah, I had the hots for, and they did a here come. Did she have one called James? Give me the ladder or something. What was that? Something, uh, something like that. Yes, <laughs> yes. And I believe, I believe another one was Johnny Get Angry. Uh, <laughs> I think they were originally recorded by. They Johnny don't write like that anymore, do they? <laughs> no, <right. laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> she was on Here Come the Girls. I saw her on there, and at one point, there she was singing into a microphone which I later found out was a Neumann U47 microphone, which is one of the most popular vocal mics in the world these Mm -hmm. days. They panned up to this window way above her, and there was a guy standing there watching. And I knew instantly that that's what I had to do. I wanted to be that guy up there. I later found out that it was number two studio at Abbey Road. As I said, a Neumann U47, and the guy that was looking out there 
was an engineer called Malcolm Addy, who eventually became a friend, wow. a mentor. It just, from then on, I was working towards becoming what I learned was someone called a recording engineer. And I was 16, I was in the middle of taking mock GCEs, and I just couldn't take it anymore. So it was a Friday, that evening I pulled out a phone book. I wrote to as many places as I could find that might need someone called a recording engineer, which would be a couple of record companies, BBC, TV companies. So I wrote on the Friday, sent them out on the, the Saturday. Obviously, this was when the Royal Mail worked properly. <laughs> I heard back from one of the record companies on the Tuesday, had an interview on the Wednesday, heard back from them on the Friday that they wanted me to start the following Monday, so left school that day. Wow. So it all happened within nine days, and it just so happened that that studio was EMI Recording Studios, now Abbey Road. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> a boy wow. with a I'm dream. Believe, but, but, well, yeah. that, that's been my life. My life has been a dream. But that wasn't a dream path back then, were you? You were basically inventing this dream path. But what's interesting is, what other way would there be to become that person? Other than writing a letter and starting at the bottom, there wasn't a, you know, I know well, you teach uh, now, there wasn't anywhere, was there? There was another way, which was one that I dreaded, which was having to go to university, get an electronics degree and start working for the BBC within right. the, the, the technical department and, and work out from there. I hated school, so... Going to university wasn't something I looked forward to. Well, for the BBC, you have to go to Oxford or Cambridge. Yeah, yeah. Well, these <laughs> days, do, yeah, do you absolutely. remember your first sort of head-turning moment as a young man who was walking in Abbey Road, the first sort of famous face you saw that made you gasp? <laughs> it was a few days in. They started me off in the tape library, as they did everyone. And the reason for that was so you'd learn. No one knew what happened in a recording studio. And so they'd start you in the tape library. So you learn what happened in the mastering rooms, what happened in the studios, editing rooms, all of these kind of things. Well, there was one day a short time after I started there. This was January 1964. And I'm carrying some tapes along a corridor and they're coming towards me with the two Georges, George Martin oh. and George Harrison. <laughs> And I just wanted to scream. Luckily, I didn't, <laughs> considering my, my future with the band. But uh, then that's when I started to really befriend Norman Smith. They were in recording the, the songs for Hard Day's Night. And they were my favorite band, of course. I didn't want to. I had to get in to see them recording. So I started to play up to Norman Smith let me in, will you? No, they don't like strangers. You can't go in. And I just kept on at him. I was a petulant little child. What can I say? I was 16. And eventually he said, OK, come in, but stay back. So I went in there. And of course, I didn't stay back. I had a camera with me and everything. And back, it wasn't like a small cell phone back then. This was a, this was a hefty camera. So obviously, they're going to see me. But yeah, I, I took about five pictures, I think. Then at some point, and I can't remember what song it was they were recording. But Paul said, OK, we need claps. So there were a bunch of people there from the Hard Day's Night crew. And so they all went down. And I looked over to Norman and there was a, a slight sort of nod from his head. And I followed down. I went down in the studio. So there I am standing around this mic. Oh! But over one side is Ringo. Over the other side is Paul. And I'm desperately trying to keep in time with oh. everyone. They go up to listen. We're all standing down there and... One of them put their head through a door and says, OK, it's not working. Come on up. I followed everyone up. And as I go through the large grey door leading into the control room, George Martin comes up to me and he says, excuse me, but uh, who are you? I said, oh, Mr. Martin, sir, my name's Ken Scott. I just started. Get out oh now. My <laughs> so my, my first dealing with George really was being thrown out of the studio. Oh, was there a sense of class within the building? Oh, yes. Look, this was... Not that long after the, the Second World War, and it, that just that, that the whole thing was set up the same way as it had been for donkey's years. Mm. That the, everyone had to wear suits and ties. That's why the amp room guys, the tech guys, wore the white coats because they didn't want to get their suits dirty. The engineers, as engineers, are supposed to keep the suit on the entire session. Once I moved and um, became a button pusher or assistant engineer, as it is today. You had to wear a nice jacket, tie and trousers. You couldn't wear jeans. Quite right. Or anything Quite right. Like but you that. were a cockney oik. Yes. 
It's what I should well, sort of imply. Yeah, <laughs> with a middle class mother that spoke totally different from the rest oh, really? of the family, and she made sure I I spoke differently as well. Yeah, yeah we but were... a lot of that stuff was perception, though, wasn't it? Like, for instance, George Martin being the producer, he sounded posh and he looked posh, That's but right. he actually wasn't. Yeah. Right. No, I know, but you only found that out much later. Yeah. I had no idea at the time. I thought he was posh, and I think. Most of the time, I think the guys thought he was posh. Everyone did because he pulled it off very well. I just want to uh, mention Norman Smith quickly and just um, because yeah. some of our audience might know, our listeners might know who he is as Hurricane Smith because he had a couple of hits Correct. himself, didn't he, in the early yes. 70s? Yeah. Oh, babe, what would you say and don't let it die? That's it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. He, no, he was a great engineer. He just happened once again. One of those things like happened with me. George Martin was bringing in this band for a test recording, the Beatles, and the regular engineer, Stuart Elton, that George worked with, had another gig. So uh, Norman, being the younger of all of the engineers to start with, was put on that session. And because George signed the band, Norman was the original engineer, he kept with them, and he engineered all the way up through Rubber Soul. And... My personal feeling is it was him that really started the band on their, their whole experimental thing because they always wanted to change things, but so did Norman. He brought that out in them. He wanted as much as he could with the rules that there were around the studio. He changed every recording as much as he could. Well, he was making psychedelic mm. records with, with Pink Floyd at that point as well. well. Yeah, but that was once he moved into production. Right. But what's interesting with a lot of these guys, and especially with you know with you and everyone, Ken, is that Gary and I come from a world where there was no such thing as a house engineer. When you booked a studio, right. who are we going to get to engineer this? Yes. So all the guys who sort of who wrote the book, they were the people in the room, and so it's not like you know so and so was this amazing engineer, and so that's why they got him. He was the guy there, and yes. so he had to be. Yes, <laughs> you had to absolutely. Be, you know, yeah, a certain amount of that also with the with the. They weren't producers back then. George Martin wasn't a producer. He was an A&R guy. Yeah. Yeah. A&R guys had a totally different setup than they are now. They were there, it was artist and repertoire. They were there to find the act, to find the songs that the act would record. Because most of the acts, up until the Beatles, they it was other people's songs. You had some amazing faces coming through there as well. You had, didn't you get involved in sort of Judy Garland's uh, recordings and Peter Sellers Shh. and... Yes. With Judy Garland, I was the assistant engineer on... She did some songs with uh, Lionel Bart from Maggie May, I think, was the musical. I was the assistant on that. The London cast recording of Camelot. I did some sessions as an assistant with Daniel Barenboim. Oh, wow. That was the great training at Abbey Road then. You got to work on all of these different sessions with seven of the best engineers in the world at that time and got to see firsthand the mics they used, where they positioned them, all of this kind of thing. And more importantly, you saw the personal structure between the producer, the engineer and the artist, which was very important. And I still believe, I teach now and give lectures. And one of the things I always say is that as far as I'm concerned, to get on in this gig, 75% of it is personality driven. Mm -hmm. You have to get on with the artist you're working with because if they don't trust you, they're going to be looking over your shoulder the entire time. And uh, that's no way to work. Later on, you get more involved in the recording of the Beatles stuff, do you, Ken? In the White Album and Magical Mystery Tour. Are you, are you actually engineering on those records? Correct. Is that with Jeff? Jeff had quit twice. Magical Mystery Tour and then the White Album. I got plonked down behind this mixing console. At the time, the most complex piece of electronic gear I'd ever seen in my life. This 18 4 out board. The first thing I ever sat there for to try and record was Your Mother Should Know by the Beatles. And luckily for me, I think, two things. One, they'd already recorded a version of it at an outside studio. And the reason that we were doing it this Saturday was that uh, Paul wanted to try a new arrangement. That new arrangement didn't work, so it didn't matter that I messed up. And the other thing, because I'd worked with them as an assistant engineer from side two of A Hard Day's Night through Rubber Soul, there was a certain relationship had built up. Once again, I say that's important. And they were willing to trust me. And it wasn't, it may have been a week later, I did my first ever orchestral session. And that was the orchestra and choir on I Am the Walrus. Oh my God. It, it, you said back there, sorry, you just skipped me, you said you messed up. Yeah. How did you mess up? 
because I didn't know what I was doing. I'd probably overcompress things and all okay. that. But when it came to the White Album, number one, I've already said about the great training of watching seven amazing engineers work. Then when you actually sit behind the board, normally the way it goes with engineers is they start off with recording tests or doing ads, that kind of thing. And they learn that way. I was there with the one band in the world that had no monetary problems. They had no timing problems. And they always wanted things to sound totally different every time. So as a young engineer trying to learn my gig and experimenting, this was the perfect band. I always had that thing at the back of my mind that I could completely screw up something. Let's say a piano. I could overcompress it, EQ it like you wouldn't believe, reverb, tape, stuff, do all of these things to it. And there was as much chance of them coming up the stairs at number two, listening to it and said, oh, that sounds like shit, change it. As there was them coming up the stairs, listening to it and saying, oh, that sounds like shit. I like it. We'll keep it. And that gives you such a freedom to experiment. I went into the mic room with McCartney once. Uh, he wanted to try a different mic on something. So we were just looking around. I was looking for a mic that might sound good. And he just pointed up to one. Oh, that one looks great. Let's try that. <laughs> mm. <laughs> the freedom that that gives to learn what you're doing is just astounding. But also there's a thing. What's been fantastic from watching Get Back, right, as, um, you know, as we will have, it is yeah. considering the, the fetishization of Beatles recording and how, you know, people go to such extraordinary lengths oh. to copy this and that. that. Yes. And, yes. And to see how actually unprecious they were yeah. about like, well, this guitar works. That sounds all right. Let's do that. Although in fairness, that particular recording, they were trying to capture an essence of them live where you know, what you were involved in, Ken, was, was this incredibly experimental period. So that was mm -hmm. also an education for you. But the, the experimental side, as you say, I, 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 it was that strange mixture because, number one, they wanted to get back to the way that, excuse the pun, uh, they wanted to get back to the way they'd originally been. They wanted to be mm -hmm. a band. They wanted to be more rock and roll. They didn't want, three of them <laughs> didn't want Sgt. Pepper too. That surprised everyone when the album came out. And it was great working with them during that period because it's always been put across how they were at each other's throats and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. They weren't. They were at times. Look, I've worked on projects that it would take two weeks and at some point that artistic temperament comes out and there'll be an argument and it's over in five minutes. Yeah. And it was the same with them yeah. during the recording of the White Album. All the tales we hear of other people coming. Oh, in fact, was Chris Thomas around? Was he assisting? Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. When George Martin was on vacation in the Greek islands, we got more work done with Chris producing than we did with George the entire time. It was great working with Chris, and I, I see him from time to time now. Chris Thomas, who went on to went on to yeah. produce the Sex Pistols as well, <laughs> and, mixed, music. and mixed Dark Side of the Moon. Yes, yeah, yeah. Because that's a funny thing. I don't know when, how, we, what order we're going to do this is because you've had so many hats, Ken. The yes. fact that you produce. What's interesting is. Is because a lot of people, they go and they become a producer and then that's it. They're a producer. Whereas yeah. you go back and you engineer things. You're yeah. going, you've got all sorts of balance engineer on. Well, that's, that's the same thing. Is it? That's a recording engineer. It's just an older term I've never, for it. I've never, it's brilliant. I've, the, I've only ever seen it once. It was on your oh. list of credits. Well, because there are two ways of approaching production, aren't there? There's the one that go where it's the engineer producer, the yeah. guy who's good at the desk and handled it. And then there's the musical producer. The conceptual like George producer, Martin. Yeah. I, as a producer, I always engineer my own sessions. I just found it easier because I can just reach over, turn a knob and know what it's going to do and know how much to do it instantly. Whereas when I sit beside someone, an engineer, I'm always worrying, okay, just turn up the hi-hat a bit. No, no, pull it down a bit. I spend too much time thinking about the sound and not enough mm -hmm. about the music. When I engineer it myself, that's second nature. So I don't concentrate on that. I concentrate on the music. But my style of, of uh, production... I learned from George Martin and from Gus Dudgeon, as far as I'm concerned. And that yeah, is yeah, that yeah. talent is put into the studio to do one thing, and that's to create. And you have to allow the artist the freedom to create, always knowing that if they go too far afield, you can say, you know what, guys, it was better 10 minutes ago. Let's, let's go back a couple of steps and let's go from there again and see if we can come up with something better. 
And that's the way George, for the longest time, I didn't know what George Martin did. He didn't seem to be doing anything. But looking back over time, I know exactly what he was doing. He was allowing them to do what they had to do, and that was create. I know exactly what you mean. Like I remember working with Steve Lillywhite once and just okay. thinking, yeah, well, what exactly is he doing? And then you leave the studio and go, oh, my God. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you did Hey Jude. No, I didn't, actually. We, I started it, but then it, w- it was actually recorded at Trident Studios by a guy called Barry Sheffield, one of the owners. Got it. Because I thought that was the, one of the reasons you ended up moving over to Trident was because of that. So I, I, it, it was a, a couple of things. There was uh, the fact that I went down there when they were recording Hey Jude. So I'd already seen Trident and liked the feel there. It had the first eight track machine. Yeah, and it, Trident, was running which is twel- in Soho. and it was running at 12 and a half inches per second. So as soon as there was a second eight track studio, everyone was complaining because they'd go into mix and they'd find out that everything sounded like Pinky and Perky. Well, the, the chipmunks, because it was running fast. Because what happened was the owners of Trident bought the Ampex. It was an Ampex 8-track. They brought it directly over from the States, not thinking that the cycles per second of the electricity over there ah. is different to over here. So the tape machine ran slow. What was So was there a eureka moment? Was there a kind of, God damn it, I want to produce? Eureka, no. It came over time. And it, it's one of those things that a lot of engineers find. You'll be sitting there. You've got the producer by the side of you, and you'll turn to the producer and say, "You know what would sound great underneath this guitar solo? A herd of trumpeting elephants." The producer looks at you and says, "You, you really think so?" He says, "Yeah, I think it would sound good." So you bring in the herd of trumpeting elephants. You record them. They go off. If it works, it was the producer's idea. If it doesn't work, oh, well, it was just Ken's idea. I didn't think it would work anyway, but I thought we should try it. <laughs> that happens enough that you start to think. Maybe you should get rid of the middleman. Well, you know the old joke, don't you? How many producers does it take to change the light bulb? Well, you tell me. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, oh, right, 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 right. Very in. I mean, yeah. But the thing is, I mean, listen, I, I don't really want to leave discussion on the Beatles behind, but that could yeah. take up more and more time. And yeah. more, there's so much more to your career. If Abbey Road represented all the great recordings of the 60s, then the, the early 70s was definitely Trident as the studio of choice. You know, the, out of Trident came, glam rock was born, really. But that was partly because you your hand was being held by Gus Dudgeon, who, who was one of the great producers of that time, especially with Elton John, obviously. Yeah. Is that How did he come into your life? Well, he came into my life at Abbey Road. I worked with him on two singles by a band called The Locomotive, well, I can't remember what the first one was called, but the second single was Rudy's in Love. It was a ska band. And because of my recording with them and listening to Gus and giving him what he wanted, I got fired from Abbey Road. Oh. Because I'm not supposed oh. to listen to the producer. I'm supposed to do the rules of Abbey Road. Well, that happened just as I'd got number one in uh, the English charts with the White Album. Well, in fact, the worldwide charts with the White mm-hmm. Album, which isn't a good time to fire someone. Are you still persona non gratis there? I mean, oh, when you no, arrive no. at the door, was, the security rush out. No, I, I was back there just a couple of weeks ago working on something. <laughs> and uh, no, I go back there as much as I can. It's my second favourite yeah. place apart from yeah. home. It must have been some ill feeling at the time, though, wasn't it? Well, with the manager when he did that. Yeah, but I got the gig back. I went to the head of EMI Records and explained what had happened. He said, that's bullshit. You've got your job back. And the the manager had to apologise to me. And uh, I was there. But I knew there was a target on my back. So I started to look around and I actually asked Gus, where do you think I should go? And he had been doing a lot of work at, uh, at Trident with one of the owners, Barry Sheffield, the guy that recorded Hey Jude. And Barry wanted to quit engineering. He didn't like the hours. He wanted to just stay as manager and owner of the studio. And so Gus said, why don't you come down to Trident? We can continue working together. Went, interviewed, decided to work there. And the funny thing was, I wasn't put on any sessions with Gus for the longest Ah. time. Robin Jeffrey Cable was the guy that tended to work with with, uh, Gus a lot then. And it wasn't until Robin had a really bad car accident this was after recording Madman Across the Water. Elton John. They'd recorded that. He hadn't mixed it. There was no way he was going to. So Gus said, let's get Ken. And I mixed that and then continued working with Gus and Elton on uh, Honky Chateau and Don't Shoot Me, I'm Only the Piano Player. 
Wow. What albums they were as well. I yeah, mean, that extraordinary. Was really, he was, what was mixing light back then with I mean, how big was your desk? I mean, was it sort it, of... It was, it was a 16 in, 8 out, I think it was, something like that. Mixing back then... It, it was like a band effort. You had everyone around. We've uh, come it, to this a few times, yeah. Yeah, yeah like, right. Everyone and on it, their knees with their few yes, faders yes, each. Yeah. People leaning over the back of the, the desk, changing <laughs> things as you go. It was great. And everyone had to get it exactly right at exactly the same right time. Much like the band playing in the studio. That's something I miss both personally and listening to today's music. That, that humanity of yeah. everyone coming yeah, together. Yeah. It was also terrifying. I remember there's a couple of things where I've been on the mix and you've got your one thing to do in your way. It's like being the percussionist oh, yeah. in the 1812 oh, yeah. overture. Yeah. <laughs> you've just got that one moment. You're going, oh. Yeah. Let's, let's just talk about Elton though, because okay. I mean, this is an extraordinary talent. There's an album, I think it's from 1971, of him doing a, an American radio show with his drummer and his bass player. Yeah. Um, Nigel Olsen. Nigel and, and um, D. 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 Murray. And the talent, this guy is 21 years old or something, mm -hmm. the talent is extraordinary. How can you even produce someone like that? Really, you're just trying to capture as much of you can as uh, the essence of this incredibly talented boy. I came in a bit later. I think Honky Chateau was like his third or fourth album. Oh, think. it was it was the first uh, Elton John album I bought. It's a, still a masterpiece. Oh, OK. Yeah. Well, by then, the trust between he and, and Gus, it was Elton would be there for the basic tracks vocal overdub, and that was it. Everything else was left up to Gus. I think, once again, it probably took that time to start with uh, building up the trust from the earliest album, and then you take over. It, I said I learnt from Gus. No one from the band ever came along to mixing until we had something to play them. They had no part in the mixing whatsoever. And it's very much like me with, with Bowie. It was when I started to produce with Bowie, he got bored in the studio. David was the most amazing performer in the studio I've ever worked with. Of the four albums I co-produced with him, 90 to 95% of the vocals were one take, first take, beginning to end. Mm. I would play a little, he'd sing along, so I'd just get the level and sound, go back, hit record. That one time through is what we still hear today. But didn't he come in and you say, and people say, well, maybe you should redo that bit, maybe you should drop in this section? Were there ever those discussions? I learned very early on, no, <laughs> you don't do that. And would he be doing that with the band? Or, or, I mean, would the band record alone and then he'd do a vocal or would he do a guide or, you know? Oh, sometimes he'd do a guide. Yeah. Sometimes he didn't. He'd be up in the booth with me. Sometimes he's down there just playing acoustic guitar along. It varied. There was no set mm, pattern. Right, right. Vocals would always just be him down there. Sometimes it was just me up in the booth. Sometimes it was other members of the band. More often than not, Rono, Mick Ronson, the guitarist. But uh, because David got bored in the studio, he wouldn't come to the mixing. So much like the Elton and the Gus situation, I was left alone to do all the mixing with no one there. Let's, let's, I this, this, wonder, this, yeah, this, sorry, Gary. I was just saying, this so one, I don't want to jump ahead. No, I don't want to jump ahead at all. But I was just talking about Rono. I'm just wondering about how much time he was with you because I'm I'm assuming he was so involved in the arrangement of those songs back then. Yeah, he did the strings for uh, for Life yeah. on Mars on the Hunky Dory album. Yeah, all of the orchestral arrangements Rono did, but he was exceedingly important. He was David's right hand man without a shadow of a doubt. But one of the secondary talents of Bowie was his ability to put together a team that would give him exactly what he was looking for without having to tell them what to play. Rick Wakeman, for example. Yeah. Yes. And it was that whole thing of Woody Woodmansey, Trevor Boulder, Mick Ronson. Yeah. On Hunky Dory, it was Rick. Later on, it was Garson, Mike Garson, and me. We all knew what we were going for. We didn't have to be told what to do what to look for. I don't think David ever told me once, I want it to sound like this. Yeah, and I've got to yeah. say, one of the most perfect, timeless bits of recording ever, that album. It's just- Which one? Hunky Dory. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, thank no, it, you. Yeah, it really is. And why did you leave the telephone in at the end of, yeah. uh, of Life on Mars? I mean, who was ringing? Because <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> Did anyone pick it up? <laughs> what it was at the side of Trident Studios, there was this bathroom. A toilet and there was a public call box in there for session musicians because halfway through when it's a tea break they'd all line up to use it to call their fixer to find out what their next session was where to go in the <laughs> afternoon or the evening or whatever and this this one occasion we had tried to get 
Life on Mars, the, the basic track. And dear Rick, he was having one of those glorious days when he was just messing around the entire time and we were finding it difficult. We eventually hit on something. It was going perfectly. And then suddenly I had to stop the entire recording because the phone rang in the bathroom and the piano was right by there. So we picked up the telephone in the piano. So I stopped it and Rono was pissed. He was swearing like a trooper about it. So we used to save tape. So I went back to the beginning of the reel and we started recording again. And we eventually got the master basic track. When we finally came to do the string overdub, Rono had arranged it so that the strings just sustained at the end, just kept going so I could fade them out. Well, when they're sustaining, suddenly we hear this piano come back in. It was the very end of that bad take where the... the, Oh, come in. It came up underneath them and we heard Rono swearing and everything. We, we've got to keep that in. We have to. That's great. But when I mixed it, I had to pull it out fairly fast because the BBC would never play it with Rono the way he was swearing there. So, it, yeah, that's the story of, of that. Oh, <laughs> Fantastic. man. That was the first record you ever produced as a credit. Did you go into those se- that session thinking, I have to behave differently now? No. I have to express myself differently because they want something else from me. I No, I, th- I think it was basically the same, except without, as I said, the middleman, the other person that played producer. It was w- when we needed to discuss things, we'd just discuss things. And it was very much like yeah. it had been before, except it, it was me and whoever. Which One interesting thing about just, sorry, a general point about mm-hmm. Trident, because you're going from Abbey Road to Trident, which is now, yeah. and, and Trident, I would have thought, represents this whole new wave of the burgeoning sort of rock and roll based recording scene. Mm-hmm. And because you said that apart from the Beatles, Abbey Road, all the way through the 60s, was still actually run as three hour sessions. Yes. Was that gone when you went to Trident? Was it all? Oh, yeah. Well, it had it, it pretty much gone at, at uh, Abbey Road at that point as well, uh, thanks to the Beatles. Orchestras still run like that, don't they? Yeah, they did, yes. Yeah. They're, they're, yeah, there were several things, like orchestras with Life on Mars. I did a 5.1 mix of Ziggy and Life on Mars. I believe it was about 2000, something like that. And I hadn't listened to any of the multitracks or anything like that in 30 years. And I'm doing it at Abbey Road, pull up the string faders, and suddenly everything's coming through. My first instinct was that something had gone wrong and everything was coming through on this fader. Then I, saw, I was thought back and I realised back then the orchestras, the string players especially, refused to wear headphones. So we, we had to feed them the track through speakers. And obviously oh. if it's loud enough for them to hear it, it's going to be oh, picked up on the mics. And That's so amazing. Part of that, that training thing back then, you learn to blend things together. So if there's a lot of bleed going in the strings, you work with it. I just want to just reveal to people a bit of what's going on in the timeline here. because okay. So Gus oh. Dudgeon had taken over from Visconti because Visconti didn't like Space Oddity as a song. Yeah, correct. And Gus had made that Space Oddity record. Did you work on Space Oddity? Not on the single. I did on the album. Okay. So suddenly you've got Visconti. I mean, this is glam rock city, isn't it? Trident. You know, you've got Visconti doing Mark, doing T-Rex, and, and you doing Ziggy Stardust in there yep. as well. And so... The two of you, you must have seen Tony Visconti as your um, competitor in a way, I guess. We, look, we have different styles. I worked with Visconti as engineer on uh, the Space Odyssey album and on Man Who Sold the World. That's how I got to know David in the first place. And, and Tony is a musician. He's a bass player. He, he Very played good bass, bass player. On, yeah, he played bass on those records. And he was like the MD, the musical director. He took charge. And because of that, I didn't see too much of David in those recordings. They were his songs, they were his vocals, but it, it didn't seem to be too much of him. That His big thing was working with Gus on Space Oddity, where Gus, it was all David's ideas. Gus took David's ideas and just perfected them, whereas I got the impression on the album and on Man Who Sold the World that it was more Tony's vision okay mm-hmm. so what happened was after the the failure of man who sold the world at the time 
David took some time off and he came in to produce a friend of his, a guy called Freddie Beretti, who went on right. to yeah, yeah. design a lot of clothes. Yeah, that was the group name, yeah. And I was doing one of the sessions on that and during the course of the conversations, this was when I had decided that I wanted to move into production away from just engineering. Talking with David and I told him about that and he said, well, I've just signed a new management deal. They want to put me into the studio to record an album so that they can shop a deal for me. I was going to produce it myself, but I don't know that I'm capable of doing it. Will you co-produce it with me? And I thought, here's this guy that I loved him. He was a really, really nice guy. He obviously had a certain talent, but from what I'd seen, I didn't see him as being a superstar or anything like that. He was just, he was good. So my immediate reaction was that I could actually mess up. Unlike with the Beatles, I'm, I'm thrown in at the deep end with the greatest band in the yeah, world. Suddenly yeah. there's this somewhat talented guy. I can afford to make mistakes and, because people will never hear them. Because he'd had a lot of failures as well as after Space Oddity. It, it was the things that did, weren't yeah. working so well. No, absolutely. That was the thing. So it was a couple of weeks later, David came round to my place with Angie, his wife, and Bob Grace, his, his publisher. We were going through cassettes for songs for Hunky Dory. And it was very quickly that the light bulb went off that, hang on, this guy is far more talented than I gave him credit for because I was starting to hear David's ideas as opposed to Tony's mm. ideas. Right. Mm. And suddenly I got nervous. I thought, here we go again. This guy could be huge. And I think for both of us, when we started Hunky Dory, we were both a lot of trepidation there. Both of us were fulfilling a place that neither of us had really done before, the producer, the, the co-producers. But as, as we worked and things started to come together and we were hearing what it was becoming, we got more confident, more confident, so we could push the envelope that much further kind of thing. And it just finished up working great for four albums. There was a sound, wasn't there, on the Ziggy Stardust album, on the Aladdin Sane album, that I, as a kid, tuned into. It became, for me, the sound of glam rock. OK, there's the way David sang in that Cockney high voice. <laughs> the Tony Newley voice. Sound there was a, there was another sound. There was a, the backing vocals were thin. They were had a kind of very different sound to them that I'd never heard before. There's also a drum sound that I could yeah. absolutely that fantastically tight clipped snare. It's brilliant. It's very very small. Well, like on control. five years. I mean, yeah, you know, rock and roll suicide. Can you hear what we're talking about, Ken? And what was it about that you think gave that such a unique quality? Was it Rono's guitar? It was the team effort. It was, we were all heading the, to the same place. We, we mm. knew what was needed and we just did it. And for the, the drum sound, it was, that took a certain extent came from my working with Ringo. It was a very dead sound because a lot of Ringo stuff, we had tea towels covering everything. So it was very dead. It didn't sound quite the same way because it was in a big room. It was in number two studio. Whereas at Trident, right. there was this small drum booth underneath the control room. That's where Woody was. So that gives it a much smaller sound. That plus deadening yeah. everything down gives that sound. Yeah, yeah I just want to, because we'll get to him later, but I, referring to that, I did read somewhere that to get Billy Cobham's snare to sound a bit uh, more dead, you got him to put his wallet on the snare. I didn't get like... him to, he suggested it. I said it needed to be down to <laughs> okay. bit, and he said, oh, I got just the thing. He pulled out his... Some drummer's drum, wallets would be heavier than others. Well, yes, we yes. Didn't get that, because on Spectrum, I actually, I actually say it was much more, it, it's kind of quite lively, but still that same very high-tuned thing that seems yeah. to be quite a signature of yours, that snare. We'll get to that later. If I might just get in there for a second, the whole thing, the first time I recorded Cobham was at Trident. It was on Birds of Fire album. And suddenly I've been used to the like two or three tom-toms, one bass drum that fitted in just about into the drum booth. Suddenly this guy comes in with eight toms, two bass drums, this whole thing. Of, what the fuck? <laughs> I just realized I have to set him up outside of the drum booth. It's not going to work in there. But everything else was identical. I used exactly the same mics on Cobham as I used, the type of mics I used on Cobham as I did on, on Woody. I just had to use more of them. And he was outside the drum booth, so it was slightly more liver. Wow. But mm -hmm. no. Okay, so go. should we do Ziggy? Because I just wondered about this, the band thing. If the band was a set up, you had that band set up, you went in, you did the album. And that will, you know, if it was sort of more piecemeal than that. Well, we'd do basic tracks. And I say, it, yeah. it depended on the song. It depended on what would go down at any given time. On just using Life on Mars, although it's not Ziggy, but using Life on Mars, it was bass, drums and piano that went down. That was it. 
other songs. It would be David on acoustic, Rono on electric, Woody and, and yeah. Trevor. It mm -hmm. varied everyone, okay. but we, we'd get the basic tracks and then we'd start overdubbing and that's when it became a bit more piecemeal. Because there is a lot of bullshit about the concept of Ziggy, I think. You oh, know, absolutely. And, and as, <laughs> you know, I think a lot of people have drawn lines between very disparate lyrics and songs to try and find some storyline that really doesn't exist. I don't think... You know, David was just writing lyrics at the time that were that had a similar feel to yeah. them, that had similar references, and people have tried to create a story about it afterwards. I mean, the song Starman, you you had to go back in the studio for that, didn't you? Right. Because the record company said there wasn't a hit single on the, Correct. On the album. Correct. That's the thing I bring up all the time. A couple of things. Number one, it ain't easy. That's just a hangover from Hunky Dory. How does that have anything to do with this alien coming down and... and all of that. We originally had round Chuck Berry's Round and Round in exactly the same place as Starman finished up. And it was, we handed it in with Round and Round and the record company said, there's no single. Can you go back in and record something? They came in with Starman. We recorded that and just pulled out Round and Round and put Starman in its place. And changed my life forever. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And we're coming up to the 50th anniversary of, of that, that performance. Yeah. Let's talk about, I just wanted to just zone in on one bit of that recording of that album personally, and it's the guitar solo on Moon Age Daydream, oh, which yeah. is an extraordinary guitar solo. Everyone absolutely loves this, yeah. and it's, it's got to be in my top five guitar solos of all time. But what makes it so expressive is the delay on it, that it gets more and louder and louder, this delayed echo that Rono seems to be playing with. I mean, is, was he controlling that? Was that your baby? That was me. I have this thing, I've done it with other guitarists as well. I like the low end of the guitar to be right in your face kind of thing. And the higher, I like to be area. And so as he's going up the fretboard, I'm adding more reverb. And when he comes back down, I pull the reverb back down. I'm just playing the reverb as he's playing the guitar. After he'd recorded it, yes, or was he hearing yes, that too? No, this was in the mix. It was just recorded completely flat. It's interesting you say about that, Mick Ronta. I'm, sorry, Guy, I'm going to go on about no, no, I'm, for a the, the floor is yours. <laughs> that, the floor is yours, that Gary. Close, that close sound down the low end yeah. is actually what was so exciting about what you were give, giving me as a young kid from Rono's guitar. You were putting him in my room. But he had this great way of playing with a wah-wah half-cocked, didn't he, which gave him that... It was all the way down, I thought. No. What it is, no. is he would start off all the way down or all the way up, and he'd start to play, just rehearsal, just messing around. He'd start to put it down or lift it up, depending on which where it started, and reach a point, and we'd hit the talk back. Okay, there. And he'd just take his foot off. That was the sound. Amazing. Every one of his guitar sounds was done the same way. I mean, it's interesting, because the wah-wah pedal is actually essentially just a tone control, but he's actually yeah, using absolutely. it just as a tone yes. control. Yeah. And not using it the way it's generally used, which yeah, is wah-wah-wah-wah. Exactly. Well, well, well. yeah. yeah. But it choked off the sound, and yeah. it made... For me, it made something that sounds yearning, more human. I don't know why. Yeah. That's partly his playing, obviously. Yeah. There is so much more to talk about, really, isn't there, Guy, that we can't hover around no. David forever and your brilliance with Mike Garson and Aladdin Insane and then pin-ups, yeah. which is, you know, an extraordinary arrangement of other people's songs. In fact, the first time I ever heard a Pink Floyd, early Pink Floyd song was... Wow. Was, was Emily play yeah. on pinups and I've chucked a He still plays it like that. He plays it like that, Ken. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Um, oh, which stage. is brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Um, here's the next big one we've got to jump onto, which has been fantastic to rediscover, is Supertramp. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, extra, but th those couple of years are such a golden age of record production. You know, you're coming in the footsteps of Dark Side of the Moon and, you know, I would say Quadrophenia yeah. and things like that. It's so posh. Crime of the century. Sonically <laughs> incredible. It's, it's, th thanks to my middle class mother. Yeah. yeah, exactly. yeah. It's the most privately educated record I've ever heard. No, it's, <laughs> <but was> there, <laughs> Guy's absolutely right. We've been raving about it just yeah. in the bar last night. And it sounds like a lot of it was devised in the studio. Or did those two guys who were super tramp, you know, did they come with those arrangements to you initially? Or was it something you put together... I'll tell, you, and I'll tell you what it is. Sorry, Ken, before you answer, because what seems to be a recurring theme, certainly with stuff we play, going back to old Pink Floyd stuff, and you get the same thing with Genesis and everything, where people have a bit of music and you have a section, then you stick another section of music, then you stick another section of music, and then you end up with your big prog piece. This doesn't sound like that. These no. sounds like songs where it's all meant to be part of a whole. Which is the way it was. There, there'd yeah. be a basic arrangement. We knew intro, 
first verse, chorus, that kind of thing, the structure of the song. But then other bits were worked out once we got a basic track. Like, I don't think anyone in the, uh, to start with considered using 18 electric guitars playing one line, that kind of thing. So that all happens in the studio. Things like the sound effects that we used yeah. on that. Everyone had been using the same sound effects from the same disc that... Uh, BBC. Uh, up to that did, point, yeah. yeah. Right, um, right. Yeah. But w we didn't want to do that. We wanted something different. So we rented an Agra, and I went to an, uh, a neighbour's house and recorded the school kids at lunchtime. For our listeners, the Nagra was the two-track tape recorder that felt a lot of outside broadcast films used. Absolutely, that's yes. It. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so I recorded them during the lunchtime, went back in the studio that evening and we'd listen through and, okay, that section works. We're, and we just threw it into the recording. Then uh, a couple of the other guys for Rudy went to, I can't remember what station it was, but one of the train stations and they recorded all, everything going on there. Now, the two weird things about that was that one of the announcements that you hear in the background, the train stopped at the place where Roger and Rick both grew up the two different places. And then the other thing, as they were walking out, there was this busker on violin. And they heard it and said, we've got to record it. Would you mind? It's no, go ahead. And they recorded him just busking a bit. And that's the lead in between the end, the main end of uh, Rudy going into the orchestral end. It's just a busker in the middle. It was never written. It just that worked. It's that, that's, that's the great thing about that time. The happy accidents. Yeah. which don't occur now because we copy and paste everything. I mean, this, is, this right. was a strange band, wasn't it, Supertramp? Because it's fundamentally two keyboard players. Uh, yeah, yes. But Rick Davis and, and Roger Hodgson. Although Roger, well, Roger's keyboard playing was more... Da, 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 okay, okay. Thing. Yeah, well, you know, one of the great songs came out of that, right? Absolutely. No, I'm not knocking it at all. But Rick was the much better keyboard player and, and Roger was a great guitarist. Because obviously, the, the, you know, Roger left in the end... Well, I think they all, they all kind of left to a point. Which makes me wonder, part of your job is finding compromise between two leading players. It can be. And not just with Supertrap. I'm no, talking no, about no. generally. No, it can be, sometimes more so than others. You, you, it's best when that doesn't happen, when you don't have to do that. It, it's best when everyone's working for the same thing, which is what happened on, on the Bowie recordings. Everyone was aiming for the same thing. I have to say, Pin Ups was the strangest one because David had fired the band. The only one remaining was Ron O. We had Ainsley on, on drums and someone else was... Sorry, didn't Trevor Boulder play bass? On well, that? that's what I'm just about to get to. The, ah, what sorry, made it Ken. weird? No, don't worry. What made it weird was that there was supposed to be another bass player who pulled out about a week before we were going to France. And so David had to go and ask Trevor to come and wow. play with him again, having just fired him. Which made it weird for Woody. Well, it made it weird for everyone. Yeah, just no, yeah, just yeah. very strange. Yeah. You can imagine... Not going to say who that was. No. <laughs> A very He's famous a bass player. I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Did he play on Hunky Dory? No. Not Hunky, sorry, on Man Who Sold the World, I mean. Did he no. play on Transformer? <laughs> No. Uh, well, Herbie, it's not the one I'm thinking not Herbie, no. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I understand what you're saying. That but admittedly, is... but that record's going to say David Bowie. Yes. So, Gary, I guess that's, that's the point about, you know, having the competing visions. Yes. You know. I always had this thing, my view of working with David. We never, ever discussed a record once it was finished. I never knew if he liked my mixes or not. It was never discussed. It was just on to the next record. And well, yeah, because you were making Ziggy Stardust when Hunky Dory hadn't even come out. Yeah. Correct. Correct. I always felt that if he asked me to do the next record, then he liked what I did on the one before. That was the only way I could gauge anything, really. And It's the best yardstick. Yeah, yeah I guess. <laughs> <laughs> After pinups, came back into Trident, we recorded something. It was 1984 stroke Dodo. And it was what finished up being two songs for Diamond Dogs. That was one of the few times that David came into the mixing session. And he kept on going and playing albums. And they were all like the Philadelphia sound. Barry White and that kind of thing. He was saying, that's what I want it to sound like. 
it's the wrong musicians, it's the wrong studio. Right. You're never going to get it to sound like that. And it was after that, finishing Diamond Dogs, that he then went to America and put together the, the right of course, team and started to on give the road. him what he was yeah. looking for. Yeah. I was actually one of the kids around the corner at the Marquee Club who, who saw him perform that on the 1980 floor oh, show. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, well, I was recording uh, that. Yeah, I was yeah. down in the front row, wow. you know, just you were? having my life changed. Uh, there was a moment when... He handed, moment. He handed him a ring. Or something. I had no, a bangle. A bangle. I, a bangle right. And I was in the front and he and I remember <laughs> looking up and he took the bangle from my hand and he looked in my eyes and, and he said, thank you. And I just want to say that because wow. David was brilliant yes. at making you feel you were the only person alive. Right? Yes. Oh, yeah. And making you feel important. I think that's yeah. why he was a great flatterer, wasn't he? Yeah. He was an amazing human being. He really was in many respects. Did you feel a disappointment when you, it, it never became your job to finish off the Diamond Dogs? No album no look it, it it was all towards the end there it was all very strange times because there were lots of legal things going on because tony de Vries, his manager had wasn't paying out where he should do and there are all of these strange things going on which that also affected pinups a little as well my relationship with david was kind of strange especially when de Vries came in but uh, no it, it's enough and i think four albums is enough on the trot mm-hmm. for, for any act and producer to do. Otherwise, it becomes yeah. samey. But also, but you had so much stuff going on. You had so much going on yeah. at this point. Well, I, I was also doing the whole jazz fusion thing as well, which oh, was a okay. complete oh, yes. change yes. in okay. my career. Guy, take the... F- Guy oh, no, I don't want to know. Because, you know, I started playing bass in 1975, right? And it was, yeah. you know, I just discovered rock and roll. And suddenly everything was about Stanley Clark. And um, yep. I remember thinking, oh, my God, is this what I have to? But those um, Returns Forever and, and certainly School Days, absolutely epochal albums, just beautiful. <laughs> and so <laughs> listening back to them, they just sound so beautifully recorded. Yep. What was it like? Oh, it was, it was amazing. It was great. The, 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 the way I got involved in that was it all started when I was in France recording I can't remember if it was Honky Chateau or Don't Shoot Me, I'm only a piano player. But it was a residential studio and we all used to sit around this huge table at at dinner time eating. And Gus or Elton would always put on a record in the background. And they kept on putting on this one record by this strange band called Mahavishnu Orchestra. Mm -hmm. And it was an album called In a Mountain Flame. And the only way I heard it was bits and pieces over everyone talking. And I thought it was the biggest heap of rubbish I'd ever heard because it made absolutely no sense whatsoever. Come back, we're mixing the album, whichever one it was. I get a phone call from someone at CBS saying, John McLaughlin and, and Mahavishnu Orchestra are coming over to do a, a BBC TV show and they would very much like to meet with you about the possibility of working on the next album. And I thought, well, that's the band that Elton and Gus are raving about. Maybe I should take another listen. Can you send me over a copy of the album? So they sent it over. I took it home, put it on, and just, it floored me. When I could actually hear what they were playing, it was just, my God. And I met with them. White City, would it have been? BBC TV Um, Studios? Yeah, it would have been. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Television Centre. Met with them there. And we decided to go for it. And it, it was a complete change for me. And what was so amazing was it was just, completely live yeah and so it was get the sound and then i could just sit back with my feet up on the board and just have this most amazing music just blasting over me it was like that old i think it was jbl ad that used to have this guy with his oh, hair yeah, yeah. going back <laughs> that was what's his name from bauhaus uh the singer from bauhaus oh, yeah? in the advert yeah pete murphy pete murphy okay it was just amazing and it, it carried on from there because from Birds of Fire, I, I then did four with Bill, Bill Cobham, and uh, three oh. with Stan, Stanley Clark. Yeah, amazing. Did you find the language, did you find any, I mean, the, the musical language suddenly being so different and so much more complex to deal with? Did you have any, sort of have to retrain your ears in any way or just think, is that no, good, is that no, not good? Uh, do I know, do I know when, what's a bum note here? <laughs> <laughs> no, that that was working with Garson. <laughs> you wondered about that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, that's but, true. Yeah, you've uh, been right right to the outer edges there, haven't you? Yeah. yeah. But uh, no, it, learning more about listening came more from another band that I worked with, a band called the Dixie Dregs. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. They were a sort of a fusion stroke country act. And Steve Morse, the, the lead guitarist, he, as far as I'm concerned, is the best guitarist I've ever worked with. He could cover any style and he knew 
what was needed. He was brilliant. Including Jeff Beck? Well, yeah. Uh, he, Jeff, Jeff is great, but he Jeff... He went on to Deep Purple, didn't he, Steve? Yes, Ross? he did. Yeah. Oh, right. But uh, Jeff has a certain style, which he is brilliant at. Whereas uh, Steve, he covers all styles, from classical acoustic there's one track on one of the albums called little kids which is him and just solo violin uh, which is brilliant yeah enough of that but he has perfect pitch i did two albums with them and the next couple of albums after working with with him i was having major problems tuning problems with the band because my pitch sense of pitch became that much closer to sort of perfect pitch and when they were slightly out it became painful and then that wore off again. And then I'd do another album with Dixie Dregs and suddenly the, <laughs> it was all back again. So, yeah, each album can affect you in different ways. But then you do right. the, there's the ultimate sort of extreme of that, which is the sort of the tubes. Yeah. You know, a band that I got into through White Punks on oh. Dope. A band who never got their no, tubes. No, absolutely. I, reckon, I agree wholeheartedly. They were brilliant. It, they were sort of zapper. They were those things slightly the wrong time. Yeah, but they but they also, they were presaging a lot of kind of what Talking Heads would be about. Yeah. A lot of, you know. Yeah. A sort of humor. stuff from, from basically from your generation of bands, Gary. It, it was you know yeah the humor and also the yeah. technology. That, yeah, well, that, the modern the, the humor side just unfortunately no label knew quite how to work with them. The first time I went to see them was at the Roxy in LA, on on Sunset Strip, and sitting there waiting for the band to go on, and suddenly th this pack of a gorilla, G U E R. The military <laughs> uniforms and all of that with the yeah, guns yeah. came running from the back and everyone's petrified. What's going on? Are they trying to take over or something? And then the band comes on. It was all part of the act. When they performed live, you never knew what to expect. There could be mm. a dozen ballerinas, a fire eater and a trapeze artist. Yeah. Every time it would be different. They just get friends to come in, anything, doing all of this crazy stuff. The, the way their, their live set used to end. Fee Way Bill, the... Uh, Lead singer. Lead singer. No, the front man, yeah. yeah. He used to take on different personas. And one of them, towards the end, was the epitome of the English glam rock artist. He was called Quay Lude. And he'd, <laughs> he'd be wearing, he'd be wearing one foot platform shoes, boots. He'd have a, an extreme Rod Stewart, huge hair out everywhere. And that's when they did White Punks on Dope. And behind them, they had these amps that were... Kill amps. It was the Fender writing, but it spelt out kill. And at the end of White Punks on Dope, something would happen and all the amps would come down and crush Quaalude. And he'd be carried off on a stretcher. They'd go into another song and he'd come back as an angel. Oh, on stage. It was just all. How does a record company put that across? Let's face it. Maybe now it. It could happen through the internet, just video and everything, because that came later. But then, unfortunately, they were all talented, talented musicians. Prairie Prince, the drummer, went on to do a hell of oh, yeah, a lot yeah, of yeah, session of work. Yeah, legend. Yeah. yeah. But they'll say, how do you translate that? How do you contain that in a recording studio? How do you... That's but the in the studio, I also did an album with Devo, and it was much the same kind of thing, where yeah. they have this amazing stage persona but you get them in the studio and they're totally professional until someone else comes in and then they'll go into their stage persona. But as long as you're working with them, you get to see their real selves, their professional selves. And, and that's what it was all about. Yeah. There were artists that suffered from being too visual and not enough on the, and couldn't get that on the record. I mean, Alex Harvey, I think of being another person yes, who, who, yes. Who, yeah, yeah. who yes. suffered on in that journey. Because we're keeping you forever, we st I just need to dive into your later career, which is where you end up with Level 42 in the yep. 80s. And that American band, Missing Persons, which... Yeah. Um, was sort of the, the American version of New Romantics. Yeah, in a way. absolutely. New Romantics was super chops. Yeah, yeah super it, chops. Interest, yeah. Interestingly yeah. enough, it, it wasn't New Romantics. One of the classic moments for me, just to explain, this band was brought to me by Frank Zappa. Which is amazing because he hated everyone. Well, it, look, they all, they all used to play with him. So that, yeah, that's I the know, thing. Warren, that's how they yeah, came that's up right. with the name Missing Persons. They were missing from Frank's band. So we recorded uh, four songs, five song demo, which I shopped all over the world. No one was interested in them. So finally, we decided we got some money together and we put the record out ourselves. Now, it just so happened through one thing or another, one track on that the EP that we put out became the most requested record of the year on a top radio station in LA, the most innovative 
radio station in LA called K Rock. K R O. Oh yeah, K Rock. K Rock yeah, broke all the British K- bands on the West Coast yeah. before MTV. Yeah, they were behind Missing Persons totally, and it became the most re- requested record of the year. Now, also at this time, we'd we'd sold out Santa Monica Civic, which was a big thing when David was playing at LA. It, it, this was about two thousand five hundred, I think it seats, something like that. It's a famous recording, yeah, David Lowe at Santa Monica. So yeah. we, we'd sold out there. And guess what? We suddenly get an offer of a record deal with uh, Capital. And we were gradually building everything up. But at, at one point, this was before the record deal, I realised what I was getting to. Duran were playing the Roxy one Saturday evening. Duran were playing the Roxy. Missing Persons were playing, I can't remember the name of the club, but it was, it was further down the road from the Roxy. And it was amazing because you could go onto the Sunset Strip, and you'd see all the new romantics going up to the Roxy, and you'd see all of the punks going down the road to our show. <laughs> it was amazing, the split there. It were, but yeah, so they weren't considered new romantic at that point. But that's the irony, isn't it? Because yes. Cucurillo ends up... With Duran, I know. Duran, 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 Duran. Yeah, yeah. And wrote Ordinary World. Yes. And the, the, the other one from that album... What was the other hit from there? Ordinary World? Come Undone. Yes, Come Undone. He got me involved with Duran as well. I worked with them on two albums. That's right. But as an engineer. But this is the thing, you're happy to go back to engineering. Yes. It's just a nice thing I just to... love doing it. it I, my, my, yeah, I love being brilliant. in the studio. I love being with creative people. Whatever that takes. The, the last full project I did was in, in Nashville, and it was with an amazing guitarist called Dave Rollins, and he and his partner Gillian oh, right. Welsh... They're way up in the, the 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 Americana field, and it it was it was amazing. It, it so much of it was live. It was a type of music I'd never worked on before, and I had a blast. It's a great album. They're both so talented, and uh, we got this really good record out of it. One of the tracks was nominated for a Grammy, and just. Yeah, if I find it interesting, if I find it fascinating, I will work, whether it's production or engineering. Did you make a conscious decision to, should I, can I use the word retire? Or was it... Oh, I haven't studio? retired? How dare so, you? <laughs> you know, so you're still out there on the market, because I know you've moved into lecturing and you come back to yes. England and you're not living in, in America anymore. Right, yes. Because you were in Nashville, weren't I, you? For two for years, yes. Wow. And before that, over yeah. 30 years in L.A., so you're still av- yeah. available for gigs? Absolutely, I am. I'm glad Absolutely. to hear that. No, I, it's, yeah. I had the best training in the world. Without a shadow of a doubt, no one's going to have the training that I had. And so I want to give back, which is where the, the lecturing to students comes in. I was brought over here to work with Leeds Beckett University up, up here in the north of England. And uh, I love doing that. I love giving back some of what I got from working with those seven amazing engineers. But I also, I know that there are people out there that love to hear the stories like we're talking today. So I love giving, I just gave a, a talk at the British Library about Ziggy 50th. And uh, I, I love doing that kind of thing. But I'm, I'm also, because of the 50th anniversary, I, there are things going on that I am closely involved in. I will say no more than that. Oh. Uh, Ooh. Ooh. No more than that. And it's just, I find... In a teaching way, the best way that I can teach is to do masterclasses. I bring in a band and I have the students or other people behind me that watch what I do because after doing it, I've been doing it for 50 years. I don't even think about what I'm doing half the time. So if I'm trying to teach someone, I can't tell them what I do because I don't even know myself. It's better if they watch me doing it, I'll reach up, twist a knob for one reason or another. I hear it. It needs a change to do that. They can then say, why did you do that? And it makes me think, exactly. I, I, I did I, that I because so right. that's the way I like to do it. So, no, I'm always doing sessions for master classes. The great thing is I'm not dealing with record companies. I go in there, record a band that I found, would do a single. They could go off with it. They can do what they like with it. I don't have to deal with A&R or marketing or anything like that or contracts. It, it's, and there's a, there's a band I've been using quite a lot lately, a band from up here in Leeds called Air, H-E-I-R, not the A-I-R band, H-E-I-R, Air. And they're brilliant. They're great. They're great songwriters. They're great musicians. I've done a couple of recordings with them down at Abbey Road for various things. And it, it's... I love my life at the moment. I take the dog for a walk in the morning and... Would you say, <laughs> would you say though, Ken, that I don't like getting down on modern 
day music but there is an element of people thinking they can all do this now Absolutely. because you can you can do it at home on, on your laptop and you know just because you're a great songwriter or you could you can get a few loops off of apple that doesn't yep. necessarily mean you're a great engineer does no. it no absolutely not it, it's number number one as far as recording wise i'm a, with everything i'm a firm believer in a team effort i don't think there is anyone that can do everything on their own at the very least, you need one other person with you, be it a producer, be it as an engineer, that's a sounding board. Now say, oh, come on, that was shit when you thought it was good. You can do it better mm -hmm. than that. Or if it's the one, but the singer or guitarist or whatever wants to do another take. No, that was the one. It's perfect. You don't need to do that. You need that outside ear. Prince is probably the only person who goes against that. Perhaps I don't yeah, know. Yeah, but look at the um, entourage. He surrounded himself. Yes, with. Yes, precisely. Mean, yeah, well, that's true. I know. No, but uh, yeah. I feel quite bad about this interview guy because I know there's all the Beatles heads out there going, why didn't he spend longer on the Beatles? <laughs> yeah, but there's the Bowie heads, there's the 70s heads, there's the 80s heads, there's ever, you know, we need a series. Okay? I mean, this is this has been a masterclass in itself, Ken. Well, so fantastic. I've, I've enjoyed it very much. I've been looking yeah, forward good. to talking well, to you. Well, then perhaps we will do part two. Well, when you reveal to us what, what the 50th anniversary treat oh, if, is going to be. It, it just, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? It's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Seriously, a pleasure. Right. What an yeah, insight yeah. you've been well. to some of the greatest music in our lives. And thank you. Th thank you. As they said about, thank you for your service. You're very welcome. And thank you for yours, <laughs> bringing everyone to people's attentions. Like it, 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 as I say, I've been listening to your podcasts and people like listening to Tim Rice talk. I, I worked with him as a producer and engineer, did a Sasha Distel album that he swears is the worst record that he ever worked on. Uh, things like, it's just all of these things. Oh, it, it, it was great hearing them If you talk, can't be the best, be the which worst. Which I've got both. It's always the, uh, yeah. One of my claims <laughs> to frame, I, I, whenever there's a like top hundred or something like that, I'll have a two or three quite high up. I'm blessed for that. But there are other people that have that. My big claim to fame is that a few years ago, Q Magazine did something for the worst album of all time, and I've got that as well. Oh, no. Well, mate, just to point something out, that is not your claim to fame. <laughs> no, having both is. <laughs> having both of them, no one's ever going to do that. Whose album was that? What was Duran what was Duran, the, album? the Thank You album. Oh. Oh no! Oh, come on, uh, that's mean. That's just, that's just mean. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And listen, if people want more detail about your life, you have a book, don't you? Yes, I do. Uh, Abby wrote to Ziggy Stardust, and it's brilliant, really. Oh, thank you, thank you. When you're back, let's do a whole afternoon of this. <laughs> we'll have, Yay! we'll have lunch. You got we'll it. Have tea and cakes. Okay. Yeah, exactly. All right. All the brilliant. best, sir. Thank you. Thank you, and safe, all safe travels. Thank you Stay so safe, much. both of you. Yeah. Okay. Thank Cheers. you, Ken. Bye. Cheers, mate. Well, I think you're right, Gary, in that what to us seemed like an absolutely brilliant interview is probably going to end up disappointing everybody. Well, all, because... yeah, all the tribes, <laughs> all the little tribes, the super tramp exactly. frog heads to be going, why did they spend more time on crisis? Yeah. What crisis? You know, I didn't want to get back to that. I, I, I wanted to get back to super tramp, but you know, the moment passes and then, yeah, but you know what this show does. And a lot of people come back to us on social media and say, I never listened to that album before, or I went back to that album yeah. and I, and I've spent all afternoon going down another rabbit hole with it. And, um, I think, you know, what's so great about what Ken did, glorious moments from the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. He's been involved in it. And then, of course, it's a sample. A sample of his is one of the great records of the 90s. You know, Massive Attack. We never mentioned that. Which which was the track? No, which was the track? Uh, it was uh, Billy Cobham, isn't it? It's, it's um, Spectrum. And it's on... Um... A Safe From Harm. Yeah, wow. There you are. So um, we don't know where the next uh, Rock and Turns is going to be coming to you from, um, but somewhere on our um, tour, our producer Ben or Ian will get in touch and say, we have this person and yes. so find your hotel room and get stuck in and we're going to be here for you for that. We are. We're always here for you. <laughs> right. Now I'm going to go off and get myself one of those scooters that you ride around on and, uh, and have a look around the town. You do that. All right. It's good night from me. And it's good night from them. <laughs>